Well, good morning, church family. Please turn with me just a few pages back from where we just read in Mark, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, page 982, if you're using your pew Bible, Matthew 21. So last week in our study through Matthew's Gospel, we saw the Jewish leaders confronting and challenging Jesus' authority as he taught there in the temple court. Remember, they tried to entrap him with this seemingly innocent question about the ministry and authority of John the Baptist. But Jesus turned the tables on them, as he always did, and instead he exposed their hypocrisy. He exposed the hatred in their own hearts. He illustrated their faithlessness with that simple parable of the two sons, one who said the right thing but did the wrong thing, and the other one who said the wrong thing but then changed his mind and went and did the right thing. And of those two sons, the son who actually did what his father told him to do was the one who was considered the true son, the good son, the obedient son. And so Jesus proceeds to tell two more parables, three parables in in total here in this little section. And this week we're going to look at the second of these three judgment parables that Jesus tells to the priests and the elders of the people there in the temple in the midst of a throng of the people of Israel. Three parables that illustrate Israel's rejection of God and God's resultant judgment on Israel for their faithlessness and hypocrisy. And so in this second of these three parables this morning, we're going to see, we're going to hear more about these same themes of judgment, hypocrisy, fruitlessness that Jesus has been talking about for some time now, now that he's rapidly approaching the end and the fulfillment of his earthly life and ministry at his crucifixion at the hands of the Jewish leaders there in Jerusalem. Now, he's already pronounced his judgment, right, when he cursed the fig tree. But then we have to ask, why? Why is God going to judge Israel? For their fruitlessness and hypocrisy, yes, we saw that already. But as important as that is, hypocrisy is really only a symptom of a deeper underlying disease. It's the tip of the iceberg of the problem of the nation of Israel. Because what their fruitlessness exposed what their hypocrisy actually exposed or actually indicated was that for all their uh, external um, religiosity, all their uh, trappings that looked good from the outside, their, their rigorous commitment to what they said was righteous living and personal piety, all their claims to be the children of Abraham, the children of the covenant, deep down on the inside, they were none of those things. They were not truly Abraham's children. They were not truly children of God's covenant. And so God's judgment was about to fall on them, not because they were sinful, but because they were unrepentant. For all their works, all their claims, all their knowledge, all their lineage, by and large, the nation of Israel had rejected God. And that's what Jesus is going to expose here in the parable we're going to read this morning. So I hope you've turned there by now. Let's read. Matthew 21, we'll begin reading in verse 33 and read through the end of the chapter. The Apostle Matthew, under the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit, writes these words. This is Jesus speaking. Hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When, therefore, the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the Scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. 
When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, this morning, I pray that you would give us ears to hear your warning in these words. Give us eyes to see the beauty and the love of Jesus. Give us hearts to respond to him in repentance and faith. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as you've uh, hopefully picked up on by now, one of the major themes of Matthew's gospel is the kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven? How do you enter the kingdom? What does the kingdom of heaven mean? Who actually are the citizens of the kingdom? Who are the true people of God? And this morning's passage deals with that exact theme. So today, we're going to try to put ourselves into the shoes or the, the sandals of the people there in the temple gathered around Jesus, hearing him teach. We're simply going to start at the beginning of the parable and go right through the end. Along the way, we're going to see how this brief lesson from Jesus, it reveals four things. Four things about the true and the false people of God. First, we're going to see two things about the unrepentant heart of the false people of God, the nation of Israel and her religious leaders. And then we're going to see two things about the nature of God's true people, both Jews and Gentiles. So let's begin. Back at the top, verse 33. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower, leased it to tenants, and went into another country. Now, vineyards, of course, were very common in that part of the world. They're extremely common around the Judean countryside. In that part of the world, of course, they have the climate to do this. They have the right soil, the soil conditions. Uh, everything about it is ideal for growing rich harvests of grapes. And what every vineyard needed, well, they needed just a few things. Let's see, they needed um, an initial investment, somebody with some money to buy the land and uh, provide the, the, the plants, the, the grapevines. They needed a fence or a hedge, something around the outside, the boundaries of the vineyard to keep away uh, wild animals or, or enemies. They needed a, uh, a, a tower. A tower would serve as a, a lookout post to see if enemies or animals were coming. It would also serve as a place for workers to rest and sleep. It would also serve as a storehouse for tools and equipment and eventually the, the harvest as well. It needed a wine press because that's what grapes are for, right? Grapes are for making wine. It needed a wine press. And normally these were two large uh, flat stone circles uh, next to each other like a figure eight and one would be slightly higher than the other. So you'd harvest the grapes, put them in the upper circle, stomp the, 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 to stomp the grapes until the juice ran out down into the lower circle, which is where you would collect the juice, which you would then put into barrels or skins to ferment. Those are the basic things that every vineyard needed. And so the master of the house, well, he would have been the money man. He would have been the owner, the investor, he wasn't someone who worked in the vineyard right there, but he, was the, the, he paid for the land, he paid for the construction, he paid for the wages. And as was common in those days, the owner would then lease it out to tenants. It's kind of like in American history we have sharecropping. Not quite the same thing, but kind of similar. But these tenants would then work there. They would tend the grapes, they would harvest the grapes, they would make the wine, and so in return for their work, the owner would sh let them share in the profits from the vineyard, maybe a, a 60-40 split or something like that. But this master provided everything. Everything the vineyard needed, the master provided. Everything the tenants needed to do the job that he had hired them to do. And so he set up the vineyard, he hired the tenants, and he went somewhere else. He went away into another country, conduct some, maybe he had other wine presses or other vineyards. Whatever the reason, he entrusted the care and the stewardship and the profitability of this vineyard to these tenants. Verse 34, when the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. Now, vineyards don't produce wine their first year. Uh, they, it would normally take at least four years at that time and in that part of the world, four years to get a decent wine that you could then sell for a profit. Now, four years is a long time to wait to see the first return on your investment, isn't it? Especially in the days before uh, internet <laughs> and iPhone apps to check your portfolio. And even today, starting a winery or a vineyard or a winery, it's a big investment. It's a risky investment. There's a lot of variables. There's apparently a saying in that business that uh, investing in a winery can earn you a small fortune as long as you start with a large fortune. 
I, I don't know that from personal experience, and I don't have to worry about that. I can guarantee you I'm not going to be investing in any wineries anytime soon. But at this point, even though it was only the end of the first harvest season, the master still wanted to check up and see how things were going. Are things proceeding according to schedule? Even though it's not ready yet, is this first year's harvest on track? Are they meeting expectations? They still had standards and metrics and all kinds of things to see if the harvest was on track. And so being a wealthy man, he didn't go himself. He sent his servants to do this for him to get a sample of that first year's harvest. Well, what happened next? Verse 35. The tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. And then they did it again. Verse 36. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did the same to them. Now, just like all parables do, this is where this parable takes an unrealistic turn. Because if this were just a regular, actual thing that happened in the life of the nation of Israel, the master would have had easy access to the legal system. There would have been punishments for the tenants. There would have been recompense for him. Um, uh, the, the tenants would have been ejected and probably stoned to death by Jewish courts uh, for doing these things. But the unrealistic parts of a parable are the points of teaching, right? Where the parable deviates from what we would expect to see is where the lesson lies. The parable here is obviously a, an allegory. It's a representation of something, right? The vineyard, the master, the tenants, the servants, these all represent people or things or places. So what do they represent? We have probably already thought of what they represent by now. But right here, I want to point out the first thing that this parable from Jesus reveals to us is that Israel rejected God's messengers. Israel rejected God's messengers because the vineyard is Israel. The master, of course, is God. The tenants are the people of Israel, but especially the religious leaders, the scribes, Pharisees, elders. And the messengers are God's prophets that he sent all throughout the centuries of Israel's history. Now, this metaphor of Israel as a vineyard, this is a very common metaphor in the pages of Scripture. And the way Jesus tells this particular parable would have especially brought to mind to the minds of Jesus' Jewish hearers, it would have especially brought to mind the opening lines of Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5 opens with these words, My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and he cleared it of stones. He planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it. He hewed out a wine vat in it and he looked for it to yield grapes. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it, says the Lord? For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. The men of Judah are his pleasant planting. So Israel was the nation that God chose to be his people, right? A kingdom of priests to all the other nations around them. The nation that would be the vehicle for bringing Messiah, not just to themselves, but to the entire world. But instead of remaining faithful to God, the God who created them, the God who called them out as a nation, the God who brought them out of Egypt, the God who revealed His covenantal name, Yahweh, with them in the wilderness, the God who gave them His law, the God who brought them into the promised land, the God who gave them a king, David. Instead of being faithful, they repeatedly turned their back on Him. They hardened their hearts, much like Pharaoh did when confronted by Moses. And so repeatedly over the centuries, as they kept rebelling and sinning against God and sliding into wickedness and, and idolatry and depravity of the absolute worst and most depraved kinds, God was still patient and He sent His servants. He sent His messengers. He sent His prophets to warn them about God's impending judgment on their sin. To call them back. To come back to God. Return, O oh my people. Call them back to repentance and faith and true obedience to God. But most of the prophets, of course, went unheard by God's people. In fact, Isaiah, in the very next chapter, Isaiah chapter 6, when he receives his call from God, God says, I'm going to send you to a people and they will not listen to you. The vast majority of the prophets were scorned or ostracized, imprisoned, tortured, and many of them were outright killed, murdered by the people who they were sent to call to repentance. And so this people, the people of Israel, who were physically descended from Abraham, they were marked with God's covenantal sign of circumcision. They rejected God's design for themselves and for their nation. 
They had assumed that God's promised covenantal blessings were theirs by their own right and not simply by divine grace. They ignored the corresponding covenantal judgments that God warned them about. They twisted and they distorted and they inverted God's law in order to prop themselves up as the standard for righteousness. We talked about this in the Sermon on the Mount. And then they made themselves a standard and they turned around and laid these impossibly heavy, impossible burdens on the backs of the people. We're going to talk more about that later on in Matthew's Gospel. And so all along, whenever God sent His servants to implore them to return, they killed His servants. The tenants of God's vineyard killed God's servants. Israel rejected God's messengers. Now the people of Israel knew their history. Their history is what gave them shape and an an identity as a nation. They knew how their ancestors had treated the prophets, but they thought they were better than that. So Jesus is saying here, that's couched in the words of these parables, that no, in fact, people, you are no better than your ancestors. In fact, you are about to do something even worse than what they did. As we continue moving through Matthew's Gospel through this summer, you're going to see Jesus making these pronouncements of judgment more and more directly, more and more explicitly condemning faithless and unbelieving Israel until finally, of course, they turn on him. And they fulfill what happens next here in this parable. So what does happen next? Verse 37, Finally, the master sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. And so the second thing that Jesus' parable reveals to us is that the Jews rejected God's son. The Jews rejected God's son. Because Jesus is the son, isn't he? He's the son in this parable. Jesus is the final prophet who God sends to the wicked tenants of his vineyard. There's no one greater that the master can send than his own son. But when the tenants see him coming, they conspire together to overthrow him completely and so to take the vineyard and all of its prophets and all of its promises for themselves. They're taking his inheritance. By the way, what is Jesus' inheritance as the king of kings? It's everything. It's all the nations of the world. It's the entire cosmos. It's the kingdom of heaven. They're trying to steal the kingdom of heaven away from Jesus on their own terms. They rejected the servants, and so they also reject the son, and those go to show that they have already rejected the master. Now, there's two things really quickly to notice here. Uh, First, notice that this is not a case of mistaken identity. There are some teachers and, and, and uh, authors and such out there today who re- they really, really want to give the priests and the Pharisees the benefit of the doubt. Say that they simply didn't understand that Jesus was the Messiah or that he was claiming to be the Messiah. But no, the Bible doesn't give us that option, beloved. It simply doesn't. In case you haven't noticed by now, Matthew goes to great pains. He makes it abundantly clear that the scribes, the Pharisees, the Jewish religious leadership, they absolutely knew what Jesus was claiming about himself. And because of all his miracles and all his power and his authority that he demonstrated, they knew that it was true. They recognized that Jesus was exactly who he claimed to be, the Messiah, the promised one, the king from the line of David, and that's why they hated him. They hated him because they knew who he was. That's why they conspired to have him executed. The wicked tenants recognized him as the son, and they decided to kill him and take the vineyard, the kingdom of heaven, for themselves. The fact that they did this reveals the reality that they had already rejected the master, God, in their hearts. The second thing to notice, just very briefly here, is that they killed the son outside of the vineyard. Jesus was killed outside of the city of Jerusalem. I'm not going to take the time to develop this theme this morning, but it's, we're going to look at it more as we get closer to Jesus' crucifixion in Matthew's Gospel. But it is an important detail, so please just make a note of it, a mental note, write it down. Jesus was killed outside of the vineyard. Well, then in classic fashion, at the end of his parable, Jesus asks his listeners. He draws them in. He asks them what the logical conclusion of this parable will be. Verse 40. He asked them, when therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these tenants? And it should be obvious to all 
They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Now there is some debate here on whether this answer was given by the people who came to hear him teach or if it was given by the priests and the elders and the Pharisees. Personally, I believe this was most likely the people, people who had been drawn in by Jesus' teaching. They simply answered the question as, in, as the best way they saw fit by the natural conclusion of Jesus' parables. And I think the priests and the elders had caught on to what Jesus was doing by now. And so while they were there, they simply stood off to the side, seething in their anger and their hatred of him. They were too self-righteous to be the ones to proclaim their own judgment. Because that's what that answer is, isn't it? The people are proclaiming what God's judgment will be. The people declare exactly what God is going to do to these fruitless hypocrites, these false professors of faith, these wicked usurpers who killed the prophets and are very soon to kill the master's son. The Jews rejected God's son. Well, at this point, then, Jesus shifts gears. He leaves the parable of the tenants because it's now very plain and it's very obvious to all around what his meaning and intention is. And instead, he moves on to quoting Scripture. Verse 42. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the Scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Again, he's addressing both the people and the religious leaders here. The religious leaders were the ones who were supposed to know the Scriptures, supposed to understand them, and once again, Jesus puts them to shame in front of all the people by insinuating that they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know the Scriptures. It's like you haven't even read them. And he's quoting here from Psalm 18, which, by the way, is the exact same psalm that just a couple days earlier the people were shouting as he rode into the city on a donkey. And they shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They both come from Psalm 18. It's a kingly psalm. But why does Jesus then invoke this psalm again here after giving this parable of the wicked tenants? The third thing that Jesus' parable reveals here is that the true kingdom of God is built on Christ. The true kingdom of God is built on Christ. The cornerstone, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The cornerstone, of course, is the most important stone in the entire building. It gives structure. It sets the the, the terms for the shape and the direction, the angles, the parameters for the whole building. So a building, quite literally, can stand or fall based on the cornerstone on its shape and its structure and its composition, its integrity. So builders, when they were building a building, would go to great lengths to search and find the right cornerstone. They would inspect brick after brick and stone after stone to find one that met the standard for what they were building. But again, the Jewish religious leaders, they tried to usurp and steal the vineyard away from the master. They were trying to build their own tower. They were trying to build their own kingdom of heaven, as it were. And they tried to make themselves as the cornerstone, and so they rejected the true cornerstone. Jesus, of course, is the cornerstone. He is the cornerstone of God's people, and not only in the New Testament age, by the way. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of God's kingdom, past, present, and future. The saints who came before us, the saints who lived and died before Christ Himself are part of the church, the true Israel of God. Jesus is the cornerstone. Do you remember what Peter said to Jesus back in Matthew chapter 16? Jesus asked His disciples, Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, You are the Christ the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, the rock that is what Peter just said, Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the cornerstone. Jesus is building his church. Killing the prophets can't stop it. Killing the prophets won't stop the master from coming back to claim what is his. From demanding judgment on his wicked tenants. Killing the son is the final testimony to the wicked tenants' rejection of God, but it's also the means by which his kingdom is built, by which it is open to all the nations. 
whoever will bear true fruit. No one could have guessed or predicted that God would do things this way through a carpenter from Nazareth. That he would pay the price to ransom his people from his wrath on the cross. To defeat sin and Satan forever. No human invention could have devised it. This is the Lord's doing, not man's doing, and it is indeed marvelous in our eyes. The true kingdom of God is built on Christ. So what will happen to God's vineyard then? To whom will he entrust what is his? Verse 43. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. So the fourth and final thing that Jesus' words reveal here, the true people of God are those that produce fruit. The true people of God are those that produce fruit. I hope that sounds familiar to you by now. The true people of God are those who produce fruit, true fruit in keeping with repentance. And as we saw before, the only way to have true fruit is to have a true root, to be firmly planted and united to the vine, which is Jesus Christ, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Him alone. And he says he's taking away from the kingdom of God from them. Now, it's not that he's taking the kingdom of God away from all ethnic Israelites and giving it to some other ethnicity. No, that's not what this means. And praise God for that. Praise God there are still ethnic Israelite people who are true believers, who believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah and are numbered among God's true people, the true Israel of God. But in Christ, Christ who we call the true and better Adam, God is constituting for himself a new humanity. Not based in Adam and his sin, but based in Christ and his righteousness. The true people of God, the ones to whom the kingdom will be given, are those that produce fruit. And praise God, it is not limited to the physical descendants of Abraham, but in Christ it is opened and extended to his spiritual descendants. Paul talks about this so much in the book of Galatians. People from every tribe and nation and tongue, whether Jew or Gentile, all who call upon the name of Jesus Christ alone to be saved. This is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes, beloved. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The true people of God are those that produce fruit. Well, Jesus ends this passage with a word of warning. Verse 44. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. When it falls on anyone, it will crush him. This is another image taken from the pages of Scripture. Isaiah chapter 8, Isaiah told the people that God himself would become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. That's what Jesus Christ was to the people of Israel. Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar, the mighty king of Babylon, has a dream, this vision of a statue that represents four successive empires of the world until out of nowhere a stone that was cut by no human hand rolls into the view and it smashes the statue and all the empires of the world, it smashes them all to dust and then that stone grows into a great mountain and fills the entire world. That's Jesus. Jesus is the stone, and all who opposed him from the lowliest peasant to the, the, the most noble priest to the mightiest king of an empire, all who oppose him will either be dashed to pieces or be crushed by him. And the priests and the elders recognize what Jesus is saying here. They had read the scriptures, even if they didn't accept them. And how do they respond? Verse 45. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this, his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. Jesus still has the support, the popular support of the crowds at this point. That's very soon going to change. And when it does, the priests and the Pharisees, they're going to seize their chance to have Jesus killed. They will do what Jesus said they will do. They will take the master's son. They will throw him out of the vineyard and they will kill him to try and usurp the kingdom of God for themselves. They will do the same things their fathers did. They will fill up the iniquities of their fathers. They will receive God's wrath and judgment. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul said that Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Jesus Christ crucified. 
And Jesus Christ is a stumbling block to Jews. And it is a folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Only God can reveal the truth about Jesus to stubborn and sinful human hearts, whether you are a Jew or a Gentile. Turn with me, if you will, please, over to 1 Peter chapter 2. I forgot to put a bookmark in my Bible this morning. 1 Peter chapter 2. It's page 1204 if you're using your pew Bible. Peter was the first one, again, to confess and declare that Jesus is the Messiah the rock, the cornerstone, that Jesus is the Christ. Later in his life, Peter had clearly taken Jesus' words and uh, it, it, the imagery of Jesus as the, the stone. He had clearly taken these words to heart. First Peter 2, beginning in verse 4, Peter writes this, As you come to him, that is Christ, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. Of course, we, never, we, we recognize this now, don't we? Jesus Christ. As you come to Him, He says, you yourselves, that's us, the people of God, like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house. We're being built up as the church on the foundation of Christ and the apostles. Paul talked about that in Ephesians chapter 2. To be a holy priesthood. To offer spiritual sacrifices. There's no more temple now, right? It was destroyed. Where's the temple now? Us, the people of God, the church, offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious. Whoever believes in Him will not be put to shame. That's a direct quote from Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. This is the Lord's doing. But you, us, the church, are a chosen race. Remember, Jesus said he would give the kingdom to a new people, a new nation who would bear fruits. That's us. We, the church, regardless of our earthly ethnicity, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We are given the identity and the responsibility that Israel was given. A people for his own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. If you want to look up more of that, read Hosea chapter 2. Peter understood this. Peter understood both the, the, what it meant that Jesus is the cornerstone. The amazing blessing that it means for God's people, the church. But also the warning and the judgment for all who reject Christ. So how about you? Have you become one of his people? Not because of your physical ancestry or your good deeds, but by spiritual birth, the work of the Holy Spirit. We call that regeneration. The Holy Spirit brings you to awareness of your sin. He brings you to a point of repentance and faith and recognition that only the cross of Jesus Christ is the solution. His death and payment for your sins and his life that you should have lived to cover you. Do you see the fruit of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your own life? I pray that you do. Maybe you uh, think you do, but you feel like your heart is cold this morning. Maybe you're aware that you're far from God, not living as you should. Do you have people in your life who are speaking God's truth to you? If so, how are you treating those messengers? Are you treating them like the Jews treated the prophets of God? Or are you willing to listen to them? Because the longer you harden your heart, the longer you insist in your own stubbornness and selfishness, the longer you harden your heart, the more likely you are to be given over to that hardness of heart. Just like Pharaoh just like the people of Israel who rejected God in the wilderness and then they died before reaching the promised land. 
Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil and unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. The writer of Hebrews warns us. But exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. Don't trip and be destroyed. Don't let the judgment of Jesus Christ fall on your head and crush you. The priests and the Pharisees knew the truth. They knew who Jesus was, but they hardened their hearts, and so they received God's wrath and judgment. That's, a, again, what the author of Hebrews was warning about. He said, if we go on sinning deliberately after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remains any sacrifice for our sins, but only a fearful expectation of judgment. Fury that will consume God's adversaries. And as an example, he said anyone who uh, sets aside or, or transgresses the law of Moses um, dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. So how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? Who has profaned the blood of the covenant and outraged the Spirit of grace? The Lord says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. I pray that's not true of anyone here this morning. But if it is and you recognize that in your heart, the good news is that it's not too late. It's not too late. Instead of falling on the stone that is Jesus Christ and being destroyed or having His wrath fall on you and be crushed, while it's still called today, come to Him. Repent. Come to Him in faith and you will find forgiveness. You will find the rest for your soul that He promises to everyone who comes. So give up your self-righteousness. Give up your, your self-imposed slavery to, to sin. Come to Jesus and find His perfection, His forgiveness, His rest, and His life both today and for all eternity yet to come. Become one of His beloved. The great Puritan pastor Matthew Henry, he said this, The unbelief of sinners will be their ruin. Christ will utterly destroy all those that fight against him. None ever hardened his heart against God and prospered. So don't wait until it's too late and Christ becomes your stone of judgment. Instead, come to him now. Let Jesus Christ be your tower, your refuge, not a stone of stumbling or a rock of offense, but the rock of your salvation. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word of warning and this word of hope from our Lord Jesus. Thank you that in your love and your mercy, you extended your saving grace to people from every nation, even down to us today, not because of anything good that we have done, but because of the finished work of Jesus Christ alone. So that now, no matter who we are or what we have done, all who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. May we not become proud and hypocritical or stubborn, or bitter like the priests and the Pharisees, but keep us humble. Keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Keep bringing us back to the foot of the cross in repentance and faith. And then help us to live lives that bear the fruit of your kingdom, the fruit that is in keeping with repentance through the power of your Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that you give to all believers in Christ, and that the world may know that you are indeed building your kingdom. You are indeed building your church upon the rock of Jesus Christ, and that this is the Lord's doing. It is in Jesus' name for the sake of his glorious kingdom, that we pray these things. Amen.